this is uh, something that I'm really proud to be here, very excited about this, the presentation and, and having a chance to follow Murat and Jason. Uh, when it came time to, to put together or to speak for Terrapin, I spoke with Jesse and wanted to put together all of the, uh, all of the, we originally had three different speeches partitioned off at, uh, over a couple different days. When I saw what Murat was speaking about, what Jason was speaking about myself, really got a chance to put together and to find some value and, and provide a segment of this conference about innovation in terms of identifying alpha and innovation behind that. I am a, a high velocity cross asset class trader, like Jason, make my money trading for a living. Author of the book, The Little Macro Edge, Maximize Return Period of Risk. As a nine-year Marine Corps veteran, I've seen a lot of my, my, my colleagues uh, come back with, with some, you know, defending this country, um, you know, suffering from different things. And so the profits from the book that's coming out are going to support um, veterans by placing service dogs with them. And I uh, hope that's not a cue. <laughs> exactly. Uh, as a nine year Marine Corps veteran, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest things to be a successful trader today was the discipline and all the things that came from that. I'm a foreign language enthusiast, uh, having served overseas, living in Japan, living in China, majored in Japanese and Chinese, and went to Brazil last year for the World Cup as an avid soccer fan, and picked up some Portuguese and Spanish as well. And I'm based in uh, one of the more, a city that appreciates the art of speculation like Chicago and Las Vegas. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Leonardo da Vinci, 500 years ago, arguably one of the greatest minds in history. And, and when I approach things, when I try and come up with solutions for things, it's with that approach, the Steve Jobs approach, if you will. And so the goal of the presentation today, as Rod has put forth a very robust a presentation for a robust methodology of identifying manager talent, Jason has talked about some of the key metrics in terms of regime recognition. I want to come in place that within the global macro wedge itself, we talk about maximizing return period of risk. And so I want to outline some of the shortcomings that are in the industry today, both in terms of compensated managers and in the process of alpha identification itself. Also want to talk about how a compensation structure based retroactively on return period of risk can bring benefits for both the manager and the investor. And lastly, uh, a permanently named net of number, um, which can be used as a tool to identify alpha and help you in your managerial process both uh, pre-selection, during selection, and, 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 and post-mortem. So, I always like starting things with a story, and for myself, I spent high school as a liquidity provider for those wishing to prognosticate on the outcome of sporting events. <laughs> yeah, I was a bookie. And I learned an amazing amount of lessons. There was a lot of practical application that came, which is probably no surprise now that I live in Las Vegas, having grown up in the Bay Area. But a lot of practical application came from being a bookie in high school. Spots of value, market sentiment, how making a point spread and, and seeing people that would, you know, that they, they, they wanted better on the team to make them feel comfortable. There's a lot of analogies that come, you can bring over between buying, um, or between making a market and, and, uh, and trading the markets. And probably the most important lesson from being a bookie in high school was learning how to innovate. Now it's a shame that they showed up my high school diploma and I had to join the Marine Corps instead and go to college, but that's okay. But the need to innovate and to meet your clients and to adjust with the markets, that's what I took away. And this came in the form of the progressive point spread. Now, how many traders are in here right now? Excellent. Okay, how many of you have ever placed a bet on a sporting event before with a point spread? Exactly. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, point spread is a very binary outcome. But if the Giants are a seven point favorite of the Chicago Bears, which why that would ever be, I don't know. But the Giants are seven point favorite. If the Giants win by eight or 28 points, you can pay the same amount of money. So what, what happens is you can get these incredible binary events. And in high school, I invented what's called the progressive point spread. So I built a model for point spreads that if a team won by eight, the payout would only be partial versus they won by 28. So you were being fairly compensated for the degree of win based on that point spread, okay? And I think as a teenager, as an adolescent, that was kind of a cool little innovation to give my clients the damage volatility in my betting portfolio and induce them to bet more money because of the risk adjusted returns. I promise. So, so under that spirit, I present the solution today in terms of redynamicizing and reinvigorating and recalibrating how we both approach alpha and how we compensate for it. So, in the book The Global Macro Edge, we had a chance, I started this book four years ago, it comes out later on this year, and I could have written another book on macro trading strategies, on moving average crossovers. But instead, we wanted to write a book, Jason Roney has a chapter in the book, um, 
but we wanted to write a book that through storytelling would teach these lessons. Because it's very easy when you it's very easy when you tell when you teach someone in a very linear way, the thought can get lost. But if we can bust myths that exist out there, if we can show how this strategy or this process can beat conventional wisdom, the absorption rate from the reader goes much higher. And so the first myth that we bust in here, all right, is that more risk equals more return. Jason actually shows in his chapter that more risk sometimes just equals more risk. It's smarter risk which equals more return. The second myth that we bust, money always finds its most efficient home. Was well, Mirage just displayed in terms of the process he uses to find out, and as Jason just displayed in terms of the regime recognition, money doesn't always find its efficient, most efficient home. The third thing, and this is arguably the most polarizing subject of the entire book, is that emotions are your biggest enemy. We have been bred that our emotions, that are that are that trusting your sense of things is wrong. And in fact, this incredible man of neuroscience, Nish Scholl, who wrote the book Market Mind Games, authors this chapter that emotions can be, in fact, your biggest ally. So that myth right there is very in inspiring and, and very a key part of this book. The fourth thing is that diversification is the only strategy you need. Well, that's not true either. True diversification is not a static endeavor. It requires this forward-looking risk. And so again, another myth we bust. The fifth myth, there was more opportunity in the past. We actually show there's more opportunity today. And the myth which brings us to this presentation is that compensation should be based on returns. John, what do you mean? What's wrong with basing compensation on returns? How else would you do it? Well, here's why that's a problem. If I teach you, and everything you do, from what, either what Marat showed, or what Jason highlighted, is an assessing manager skill, you assess how that manager maximizes return to unit of risk, and you put in place a compensation structure that doesn't reward them for how well or how poorly they maximize return to unit of risk, you potentially undermine the entire investment process. WTF. So by putting a structure in place that's goal congruent, you can completely recalibrate how managers and how investors can approach the investment process. So when I talk about the current compensation system, here's what I mean. Let's go through a couple of examples. Example one. For most people know, there's the standard 20% incentive fee. If I give manager A $10 million with a, uh, with a, with a $1.5 million risk budget, or what I've done, a unit of risk, and the first manager goes ahead and earns the 20% fee because he had a $1, he had a $1 million max negative drawdown and he made a million dollars. Okay? The second manager had a $300,000 um, $300, drawdown but made $2 million. So why did both of them earn the same incentive percentage? One clearly maximized return to risk at a much higher level. And that's the problem that we see today. And this can have a major, major impact in terms of overpaying for beta and not actually paying for alpha. So, my solution, and I'm going to get into a lot of examples of this, is the netto number. Instead of focusing on the top line, which the myth that we most focuses on, the profits, we have context in this. So it's profits divided by a risk factor. And I'm going to show you what those risk factors are to give you this very practical formula. It takes about five seconds to implement, but it really calibrates and puts a goal congruent structure in place. And then based on that ratio, that ratio there is commensurate with whatever incentive that manager would get. So if we look here, just a couple of salient points from the netto number. The netto number is a ratio that measures, factually, return per unit of risk. It balances between the numerator and the denominator. Right now, you make $100,000, you have a 20% incentive fee, it's all about the numerator, it's all about the top line, you earn 20% of that. There's no factor of the denominator, no factor of that risk factor to put in place. <coughs> it's a simple equation. The higher the netto number, obviously, with the numerator being the return, the denominator being the risk factor, the higher incentive fee you're going to get. The lower the netto number, the worse incentive fee you're going to get. It's very matter of fact. It's retroactive. So in advance, you can agree to, all right, for the next year, you know, we're going to put this in place. And then based on that year's performance, or based on that six months, or based on that two years, whatever time frame is appropriate to that manager and that strategy, that's what you can use to set that up. And again, the, the, what I'll spend some time on is explaining what goes into that risk factor. We have the unit of risk. And we have the max negative drawdown. Those are two factors that I believe are very important in calibrating that denominator, which is the risk factor, with the numerator, which is the overall return. This, um, like I said, serves as the context for profits. Um, this, that's like, I wish I could sort of highlight this, but you basically take that, this manager would only earn 10%, because the size of his drawdown, in essence, was the same size of his return. Okay, it's not bad, he still demonstrated skill, 
but not a terribly high amount of skill according to his meta number. Manager two, instead of earning 400k incentive fees, he earned 600k incentive fees because he would qualify for a 30% return given his low max negative drawdown and his overall return relative to the risk budget. So you have two managers, one manager based on his return per unit of risk would qualify for a 10% incentive fee based on the meta number, the other manager would qualify for a 30% incentive fee. And now you're truly not overpaying for beta, which is a huge problem out there when it comes time to evaluate if you want to make an investment in an alternative strategy. Okay, so here's that scale that I talked about. As you can see, that very low netto number ends up with a one, with a two, with a three, and a very low, and a very low basis. And, and here's a little trick about this, which I'll get into, is I talk about the risk budget and the unit of risk. I love the unit of risk because ultimately, this is what what, how you define in advance what is being risked. When you ask a manager what their average drawdowns are, they say, oh, I don't know, five to 15%. What the hell is that? Absolute return strategies must have absolute risk attached to them. This is not about passive investing. This is not about benchmarking. If you can't define what your risk is going into an investment, you're risking everything. So the unit of risk truly qualifies a manager. If I give Jason $3 million, to manage, uh, $3 million risk budget, and I give manager over here $1 million risk budget, there's a context that's different if one manager creates a million dollar return and another manager creates a million dollar return. And so this unit of risk helps define that flexibility premium that you have in that investment. And so that unit of risk to me is half of what goes into assessing that bottom line risk factor. Um, half of that talks about that. And so here's, here's why that comes into, uh, comes into key. When it comes to capacity, you run into a manager that, that, that's running $100 million. He tells you, well, what's your capacity constraint? Well, I think I can run $300 million. Well, now, with this incentive structure in place, he has to think long and hard because taking more assets from management, if he truly has a capacity constraint strategy, is going to hurt him on the incentive side. Whereas right now, from a manager with $100 million, okay, give me another $100 million, who cares? I'm running a 20% incentive fee. Let's just see how far I can take this versus actually knowing how far or having to really think because you're incentivized now to only run your strategy at the true capacity with which it's supposed to be. Do I have an amen or do I have an amen? Amen. amen. All right. Real quickly, who in here is an allocator by chance? Who, who does allocations? I, I see the traders. Excellent. Very good. So the second part, max negative drawdown. It's not enough to determine how much the manager generates on that capital, but how much agony versus ecstasy they give you. We all know what that means, right? The agony ecstasy ratio. That's pretty damn important. So another thing I look at is, Max negative drawdown. That's different from max drawdown in the sense that it combines. It's like you look at a sortina, which doesn't penalize you for upside standard deviation. Max negative drawdown doesn't penalize you for your upside um, or your, your, your run from profit. So if I give a manager a million dollar risk budget, he makes two million dollars right away that loses back five hundred thousand. He didn't come into my principal investment. So for the purpose of the netto number, that counts as zero. He's not punished on the netto number for a drawdown from profits because he's still in profits. It's only when he goes to a negative debit or to a debit on his risk budget that that begins to come into play in terms of processing the net of number. That's a very important distinction and it encourages managers to when they have their bets, because again, they're absolute return strategies, it bounces off the capital that you give them from a risk budget versus the heat that they put you on to make those returns. So an example, you know, again, we don't want to punish the time period again is determined by the, by the manager in advance, but the manager knows in advance what both his risk budget is and his, his, his negative drawdown, he can work with it. So, the net number combines them both. As you see here, looking up here, we have the profits divided by the risk factor. There's another number in this case. 100K divided by 750 gives you 0.133. That's not very good. So, you end up getting, you know, a 3% incentive fee from that. Now, looking at, at, at some more aspects of this, the net number pays from 1% to 50%. It can be re-tiered or recalibrated. I set this up for illustrational purposes. If you want to go 10 to 60, if you want to hurdle it, if you say, okay, if your net number is not above 0.10 or, or, or 0.5, you don't get paid incentive fee. If your net number is not above 0.3, you don't get paid incentive fee. Whatever the case may be, it's very flexible in how you can maneuver the risk factor. But what's different about the net number from most conventional methods is it induces, it incorporates a risk factor into the compensation metric. And you, you as the investor, based on the strategy, can define that risk factor for yourself based on your portfolio needs. Whew, saying a lot here. Um, 
All right, look at it again. So let's run through a couple of examples. The first one, which you're familiar with, 3%, guy makes $100,000. Um, net number of 0.133 gets him paid 3%. We, as we progress here, we, the net number ends up you know, at 0 0.50. 0 0.50 is worth 10%. Um, that'd be 37,500. So you order 10 percent of the total profits. And we have this incremental, equitable scale that takes someone through that process. So as their return period of risk increases, so does their compensation. Amazing. We get down to where it starts to get interesting. I'm a manager. I run five million in AUM. Another manager runs 50 million in AUM. Because of this payout structure, I can potentially earn as much as the guy that runs 10x in AUM because I'm maximizing return period of risk. All of a sudden, I can truly now not punish myself where I can operate, I can deliver alpha for the investor, not beta, okay? And I can still be paid commensurately with what I'm delivering. So example one with the net of number $10 million risk, $10 million trading level, $2 million risk budget or UOR. Go ahead, we have a, the account here is $500,000 with a million dollar max negative drawdown. Not, to, not particularly desirable, but let's just see how that plays out. I add those bit together to get the risk factor, so I add the max negative drawdown of a million dollars, plus the UOR, the risk budget of two million, I get three million. Divide that by two, I get a $1.5 million risk factor. I take that 500,000, divide that by that 1.5 million risk factor, and that gives me 0.33. That 0.33 is your netto number, okay? We go and take that netto number, that 0.33, according to our last scale. That 0.33 here gives us a 7% incentive to be on that scale, fine. I know where I stand, and I work from there. So it's much more equitable than the $100,000. So the manager now makes $35,000 instead of $100,000 based on the 20% incentive fee. So the investor can make that allocation, and instead of just pulling the cap at the end of it because you didn't perform, they're actually only paying commensurate for the output that was delivered to them. This 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 truly sets up for you only paying for what you act, you only paying for what you actually receive, versus I'll pay you now, I'll allocate more, I won't allocate more. Um, it's very effective and useful in that regard. So the second example, I have a strategy up on Collective 2. Anyone in here familiar with Collective 2? It's a portal where people trade strategies. Okay. I posted a strategy starting February 11th on Collective 2. Started with a basic quarter million dollars, ten fifty thousand dollars because I wanted to run this for the purpose of the book coming out later on this year that is a third party verification source. Not only do I live on my own P&L and I have for, the, for several years now, I wanted to put my P&L out in public, at least in a hypothetical way so someone could show, I could show people how I execute the market the markets. The strategy started with a quarter million dollars, and almost four months, it's up close to 24% before commissions, 16% after commissions over the last four months, um, and I put a $50,000 risk budget on it. So that gives you a sense of where that's at. Right now, the annual return is projected at 65%. The annual return without commissions is projected at 112%, and max drawdown had 13.6%. The max negative drawdown was about 7% because it's from, from into profits. So here's how this would play out. I add all these numbers together, and I end up, if we play this out for the rest of the year, I'd have a net number of 4.84. The account would make $160,000. My incentive fee with a 4.84 net number would be 50%. The investor would also get 50% of the profits, obviously, because split it 50-50. So that'd be $80,000 return to the investor on a $50,000 risk budget. That's very important. So even after those payouts, because I maximize, or the example maximize return period of risk hypothetically here so well, the return over risk budget for the investor is still exemplary. And that's what happens with this payout scale that the more you pay a manager, it's truly goal congruent. You truly have a goal congruent structure in place. That the more the manager makes, the more you make, and you're truly receiving alpha, not overpaying for beta. So, as revolutionary as this idea is, how the hell will this ever get put into place? Well, I see three phases. The first phase is that after the book comes out and, and, and speeches like this, people will use it to compare the current compensation structure they have. Well, the current manager I have has a net number of 0.10, and I'm paying him 20%. I need to either reduce my allocation or go from there. Or, better yet, the manager should, has a, should be getting paid 30%, but I'm only paying him 20 So you can use the net number as a way to ascertain if you're receiving value from the hedge fund you're investing in or not. That's a very practical early implementation way right there. The second phase is at a smaller fund level medium fund level where people actually have capacity to take on more strategy, and they don't necessarily want to increase capacity and hurt their returns, but they want to maximize return period of risk and, and, and know they have the skill to do that, they'll take on this compensation structure as well. And the last is, of course, the people that live on beta and AUM, 
There'll be so much industry uproar in four years from now, five years from now, that they will be required to, if not this metric, have a metric that holds them accountable to how well they're maximizing return to unit of risk. In conclusion, I think the biggest thing that's probably going to resist this is education. Um, this factor takes about five seconds more to compute than the traditional compensation structure. That could be a barrier as well. And uh, the paradox is most investors, ironically, may be against paying someone 50%, even if it means them getting a net higher value, and even if it's only retroactive. Because the pension funds, the endowments, the, the boards that take nine months to a year to decide to make an investment, like, we can't pay that manager 50%, my God. Well, would you rather pay manager A 20%, who puts you through a ton of freaking drawdown, or manager B 50%, who puts you through no drawdown and made you a bunch of money? Well, we can't pay 50%. Remember myth number two, money doesn't always find its most efficient home? That's what I'm talking about. So, the adoption of the number, I think, can show that we as an industry can innovate and regulate and educate ourselves. Innovation and education is stronger than regulation. And people talk about, do hedge funds define value? This is one metric where we can prove, put our money where our mouth is, and we can define our value as a hedge fund and as people out there. Um, I will say again, the profits of the book are going to support military veterans, and, and wounded veterans are coming back as a passionate cause of mine. I was in Marine for nine years, and I encourage you all, when the book is up to buy a copy of it, or donate to some veteran charity out there because they serve for us and they put their lives on the line for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> allocated because only a managing allocator based on regime, based on, on allocation size, based on letting the law of large numbers work to the point of the model. You can truly let the model's effectiveness come through. For some strategies, that might be one month. Others, it might be six months. Others, it might be a year. But what you want is a time frame that fairly encapsulates and, and, and grabs the time frame and let the manager truly run his strategy, but at the same time not subject to excessive noise. Next question. Sir. Uh, so I, I think this is, I think I actually like this. One, one, All right. criticism, <laughs> one criticism might be it's path dependent. So in an example, let's say a year, you had a you know, the market, let's say, went up and down versus down and up, you're gonna pay, you know differently based on just that path dependency, even though you end up at the same number at the end of the year. Is, is the conventional method of, of compensating path dependent as well? Um, yes. In terms of, if, if the current method says that at the end of one year I'm going to compensate you based on your overall returns, that same equity curve that you just referenced can, can happen there as well. Clearly, I, I, would, I would say in this regard, though, that the behavior of the manager now incorporates a risk factor into what he's into that process, whereas before, I'm going to run my strategy agnostic of whatever risk budget is because I'm simply running this versus a benchmark or versus some relative performance. And I think that aspect there is at least a step in the right direction of having a meaningful yeah. discussion of risk management within that allocation conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir.